delighted that you're here, and I hope you've got your Bible with you and eager to take that Bible and study with us as we have our aims toward eternity and serving God in the meantime. I encourage you to take that Bible and follow along as we try to make application to our, to our present life. Turn me some light on, if you will, Doug, if you don't mind. I'm in the process of reading a book, not a religious book, it's a political book that shares the title with several other books, talking about various subjects. The title of the book is When, There's, when the Center Held. The focus is on the rescue of the presidency in the wake of Watergate. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about things political. But most of you know that I have interest in the political field. And so the focal point is the rescue of the presidency in the wake of Watergate because within a period of 10 months, our nation had lost a vice president and a president, both resigning due to scandal. And the presidency was in danger. Someone needed to come and to rescue, whether you think they did or didn't, or this was the right man. The title is based upon, it's, a, it's a, the life of Gerald Ford is what it's about, and the, the title is based upon Ford's work as president being much like his college days of playing football when he played center at the University of Michigan. I was drawn to the book for three reasons. One, I've always been interested in Ford, the subject, the accidental president, like Truman, who never sought the office. Secondly, and probably more so, is the author. I've always been fascinated with Don Rumsfeld. Whether I like what he did or not, it just, I was fascinated with his, his uh, turn and take on, on, on history. But I was really fascinated and intrigued by the title, When the Center Held. Think about that concept and that phrase, When the Center Held. Now that was applied politically, but... There's some other application that we'll see in just a moment. Rumsfeld said this in his author note. In football, the center is among the least glorified positions. Nonetheless, it is of central importance in the middle of the offensive line. It is invariably the center's responsibility to handle the football at the start of every play on offense. If the play goes well, one of the other players on the team receives the plaudits. The tailback who breaks a long run quarterback who launches a Hail Mary pass, or a receiver who catches the ball and races for the winning touchdown. Though fans may take little notice, the center's teammates recognize and appreciate his importance. From 1932 to 1934, Ford was at the center of the University of, University of Michigan's varsity football team. In 1932 and again in 1933, the Michigan Wolverines went undefeated and became the national champions. His final season, 1934, however, was tough. While the team won only one game, Jerry Ford at center remained its heart. Well, as most of you know, I know a little about football, but I know what a center is. But I do understand his application politically to being the center and when the center held. But I'm more interested in that title as that title has many parallels in the spiritual realm. When the center held. In the, in the center or in spiritual realms, the center must hold. Now by the center, that could have several applications. It could be applied to you as an individual. As you being the center, not that you're the center of the universe or you're the center of the spiritual, your spiritual life, but there is a sense in which you may be the center and the center must hold. Whether anything else holds or not. Whether everyone else gets all the plaudits or the, uh, or the accolades or not, you must hold because you're of central importance in your life. We can make application to a local church. The local church must be the center in the sense it must hold. Other churches go astray. Other churches do whatever they want. Society turns sour. Then the center must hold. But I want us this morning to focus on the home and the family. And talk about the center must hold. And let's talk this morning about when the center holds. This is a study of the home and the family. Is the center holding in your life the home and the family? Now you think about the center and the football being of utmost importance, though it may not get a lot of attention, 
It's of central importance. The same thing is true whether you're talking about a political figure who holds the center or you're talking about an individual or a church and in this case we're going to talk about the home and the family. When the center holds, is the center holding? We'll talk about that. Four things we want to talk about. Here's the first. Let's talk about the family and the home is the center. The family and the home is the center. Three things we want to say about that. Here's the first. Well, let's consider, first of all, that this is not to suggest that God is not the center of all that we are and do. You say, I thought God is the center. He is. But there is a sense in which He is the center. He is the center of all that we are and do. But there is a sense in which the home and the family is the center. And you'll see what I mean as we go further. Here's the first of the three things I want us to notice. Creation started with the family. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Creation started with the family. So you turn to Genesis 1 and you look at day 1 and you say, no, the family wasn't there. The man was not created until day 6. So my point is not that it was not created on the first day, but the family was there in the creation week. That's what I want you to see. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. God having created man, at Genesis 2 and in verse 18, God saw that it was not good that man should be alone. And thus God said, I will make him a helper suited for him. And so God closed, uh, took a rib from the, uh, from the rib of Adam. And verse 22 says he made woman and he brought her to the man. Now verse 23. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now verse 24. Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. What I want you to see is that God created marriage when he made woman. He created the home and the family. He created man. And then he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper suited for him. And when he did, now he's created marriage, he's created the home, and then he told them in chapter 3, they were to multiply and replenish the earth. They were to have children. Here's the point I want you to see. I want you to see that family was created before government, before nations, and even the church. That's not saying your family is more important than the church of the Lord. That's not the point. But I want you to see that family is at the center in the sense that family was created before there ever was a government. Family was created before there ever were nations. And family was created before there ever was the church. Family is at center. Here's the second of the three things I want you to notice. About family and home is the center. And that is that all teaching and all training starts in the home. All teaching and all training starts in the home. It is the parents who are responsible for the training of the children. No, we may send our children to public school. We may send them off to college. We may have encouraging others to teach them and instruct them in matters. We take them to Bible class and ask the Bible class teacher to instruct them. But ultimately, it is the parents who are responsible. And let's see this from Deuteronomy chapter 6. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> as the children of Israel are embarking upon the conquest, Moses preaches to them, and if he has a theme in the book, it's about obedience and the fear of God in the book of Deuteronomy. And you want to make sure as you take your children into the land of Canaan that they are those who fear God and they're keeping the commandments of the Lord. So here's what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 beginning at verse 4. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Verse 6, These words shall be in your heart. And we're not through. We're going to pick up at verse 5 and get the point. He's saying you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You be as dedicated as you can be to serving God. Then verse, verse 5, verse five <clears throat> or verse 6 rather, you take the principles of the Word of God and you put them in your own heart. You can't very well teach your children unless you know it and live it yourself. Now then, now then, verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. 
You're going to take these principles that you learn from the revelation of God and you're going to teach them diligently to your children. You're going to press them into your children and you're going to do it in this manner. What manner? Look at verse 7. You're going to talk of them when you sit in your house. You may be just sitting around just, just uh, shooting the breeze with your children and you're going to talk about the Word of God occasionally. There'll be an occasion to bring up the Word of God. You may be out walking by the way and you teach the Word of God to them. You're going to teach it when you lie down and when you rise up, maybe late at night and early in the morning. You're going to find any and every occasion to instruct them in the word that begins in the home. Proverbs 22, verse 6, we all could quote, train a child in the way that he should go and when he's old and not depart from it. We know the principle. We understand the principle. The responsibility lies upon the parents. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> This is New Testament instruction concerning the home and the family. Having discussed the family unit of marriage in chapter 5, now when we go into chapter 6, we have the instructions for the fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. But notice that children obey your parents and the Lord, honor your father and your mother. But now verse 4, children, uh, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Children are to obey their parents, but parents have a responsibility to the child, and that is you bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Here's the point I want you to see, and we could cite many more passages, that parents are ultimately responsible. I want to suggest to you that it's in the home that children learn about morals. That's where they should learn it. It's in the home where they learn what's right and what's wrong. We, uh, they understand something about the danger of drinking they understand something about lying. They understand something about personal dignity and modesty. It's in the home where they learn principles about what is immoral and what is ungodly and what is indecent. It is in the home where children learn the importance of God and His Word, where they learn something about priority. They're not going to learn that in public school. They may not learn that in Bible class. They may not learn that from the preacher. But they ought to be learning that in the home. They learn something about the importance of God and the importance of His Word and what is the priority. It is in the home where children learn about loving your wife, Ephesians 5. You see, that little child may not even be thinking about dating, much less marriage. They will grow up and they'll learn something about how Daddy loved his mama. They'll remember something about how Daddy treated mama. They'll remember something about the language that daddy used as he talked to mama and the tone with which he talked to mama. And they'll know something about how, what it means to love your wife. It is in the home where children will learn something about respecting your husband. Why, I see that you reverence your husband, Ephesians 5, 33. Oh, that little girl or that little boy is learning about the home from their parents and it may be that little girl is her mother and she's not even thinking about dating much less marriage but she'll remember the kind of things that mama said about daddy she'll remember how she treated daddy she'll remember things about how she respected daddy or disrespected daddy it's in the home where children learn about the the home itself it's in the home where children learn about the roles in marriage They'll learn from the model that is set before them of who is the leader and who is the one who gives the direction for the family. They'll know if mama wears the pants in the family or does daddy do that. They'll understand that. They don't have to be told that. They'll see that by their watching. They'll understand if mama willingly submits to dad. They'll know something about that. They'll know when she skirts around his directions and does things behind his back. Oh, it's in the home, it's in the family where they learn about the roles within marriage. But furthermore, here's the third of the three things I wanted you to see about family being the center. And that is that all the things that are around us are a reflection of the home. All one has to do is just stand and begin to look at the world all around them and that becomes a reflection of the home. How so? Well, let's go back to the book of Kings, if you will, for a moment. The kings in the Old Testament, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 15. This is just a sampling of many of the kings, particularly in the northern kingdom of Israel, but often true in the southern kingdom of Judah. And that is the kings were evil, and that was often a reflection of the homes in which they grew up. Let's take a sample in chapter 15. 
1 Kings 15, verse 25. Now, Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king over the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned in Israel two years. Now, what about him? Verse 26 is where we're interested. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father and in his sins by which he made Israel to sin. Here was a king that went south because his daddy went south. Here was a king that did evil because that's what he learned at home. He learned to be evil. So his being an evil king was a reflection of the home in which he was raised. That's the point. Here's what I want you to see. You take a look around and you can see what homes are like. You look at school. We have several people who are in one way directly or indirectly related or somehow connected to public schools. And I think every one of them will tell you this. That you see the behavior of the child. Well behaved, misbehaves. A child that wants to learn, a child that has no interest in learning is a reflection of their home life. Everyone will recognize that. Here's a child that's chaotic at school, probably as a reflection of their home life. See, what's going on at school is the reflection of the home. That's why I say home is in it. You take a look at churches, and you find me a church where things are not real spiritual. Over here is a church where things are real spiritual. Over here is a church where things are lax. And over here is a church where things are strong. It no doubt is a reflection of the home life in which they were raised. You take a look not only at the church, the school, you take a look at the nations. The nation is a reflection of the people that make up that nation. That is, the leaders are a reflection. How so? At least in our society, we elect those leaders. And it is true that as the leaders go, so goes the nation. We see that in the Old Testament, Israel and Judah. But it's also true that it particularly, particularly in a, a democracy or a republic, we send the kind of people we like. And when you send corrupt people to Washington and, and to the state, whatever the case may be, it's because we have corrupt people. And so our leaders are often a reflection of our nation. We look at Washington and we think, oh, what corruption? It says something about a corrupt nation that we have, which says something about corrupt homes that we have. Our nation is a reflection of the home. Morals. You look around at the morals in our society and where were those morals learned and where did they see it practiced? It starts in the home. It starts in the home. Here's what I wanted you to see, these three points. We're trying to drive home the point that family and home is the center. And that is creation started with the family. All teaching comes back to the home and the family. That's where it starts. And all around us is a reflection of the home. What I'm here to tell you is this, that when the sinner holds, it's when the family is what it should be. Because the family is the sinner. Here's the second thing I want us to consider. Let's talk about what it means that the sinner holds. You say, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this, the sinner holding. I'm intrigued by that very title. But what does it mean when it comes to the home and the family that the sinner holds? I understand family is important. I got that. And I know family began in the, in the creation week. I got that. And I know all is a reflection of the home. But what does it mean that the center holds? Let's consider that question. First of all, the family unit stays strong is what that means. When the center holds, the family unit stays strong. What do we mean by that? The family in the home doesn't fail. The family in the home doesn't fail. They choose to serve the Lord. Do you remember what Joshua said? But as for me and my house, another way of wording that, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Center holds is when the family says we're going to serve the Lord. It's where the family is doing their job well regardless of what others are doing. Be not conformed to the world. The idea of Romans 12, 1 is the world putting pressure to mold you and to shape you to be like it, and you're refusing to be conformed and shaped by the world. The center holds is when the family unit stays strong. The family is doing their job. They're doing it well regardless of others. The center is holding when service is not determined by other Christians. What do I mean by that? That here is a family that they're making their determination, we will serve the Lord regardless of what other Christians are doing. 
They may not serve the Lord. They may not be diligent. They may ridicule me for what I'm doing, but we're going to serve the Lord regardless of what other Christians are doing. The sinner is holding when we're willing to make radical changes so that this family can be faithful. It may mean we have to move. It may mean we have to leave. It may mean we have to take a stand that no one likes. We'll make radical changes within the family because the sinner must hold. What does it mean that the sinner holds? It means family members are faithful to the Lord and to his word even if all else around them fails. Back to the football. The sinner does his job even if the quarterback doesn't. He's going to do his job even though the, the, uh, the running back doesn't do his job. Even though other linemen let someone through and they tackle the quarterback, the sinner does his job is when the sinner holds. The same thing is true politically. The sinner holds when everything else is, is, is collapsing around. What do we mean by that? The family holds even if society fails. The sinner still holds. I want to suggest to you in the first century as we study the book of Revelation, severe persecution in the time of Nero, if you think the, the early date, I think a later date in the Revelation, so I think it was Domitian. But whatever the case was, in the first century, Caesar worship was demanded. In other words, your life may be at stake, you may be threatened and even killed if you would not say Caesar is Lord. Now to Rome... That was a political question. It wasn't a religious issue. Caesar is Lord was your allegiance to the state. But to the Christian it was a religious question and he could not bow to that because only one Lord was Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and he couldn't say that. So the pressure is on. Are you going to, to pledge political allegiance to the state or are you going to say Caesar is not Lord and if you say Christ is the only Lord then you're not allegiance to the state. And pressure was on. And yet the faithful refused, and that's the point of Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, even if your refusal to bow to Caesar cost you your life. You don't bow to the pressure. Society was failing. The sinner was holding. It simply means that the sinner holds, even if the local church fails, the sinner still holds. You see, churches at Corinth, we were, we're studying 1 Corinthians right now. The church at Ephesus had some that wanted to do what was right. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Things were failing miserably in some of these churches. But let's look at Revelation chapter 2. Here was a letter written to the church at Ephesus. They had lost their first love. There were some problems in the church at Ephesus. But I want you to notice verse 6. Verse 6 says, but this you have, those that hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Oh, there were some there that still had some good in them. Perhaps the sinner was holding. Look at verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. They were not done. They were not finished. The sinner was still holding in some, even though they were in the church there at Ephesus. Cite 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The church at Corinth had all kinds of problems, obviously. But 2 Corinthians 2 says that when they got it together, and I'm paraphrasing 2 Corinthians 2, they got their act together and dealt with the fornicator and dealt with him like they should have. They brought him to repentance. The sinner was holding. Somebody was in a family that wanted to do what was right. The sinner holds when you want to do what's right regardless of society failing, regardless of the local church failing. The family must be a strong family that will guard against anything going on within the local church that's in the wrong direction. Let the elders lead in the wrong direction, the sinner will still hold in your family. Let the church go astray, the sinner will still hold within your family. The sinner must hold. The sinner holding is when friends fail, the sinner still holds. Your friends may go astray. Your dear friends may go astray. They may involve themselves in things that you can't participate in and you recognize, you know what, I can have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We must hold. The sinner must hold. And so what have we seen here in this section? 
What does it mean for the sinner to hold the family unit, stay strong? It means the family members are faithful to the Lord and His Word, even if all else begins to fail. The sinner still holds. Let's talk about a third section. Let's talk about when the sin sinner doesn't hold. Is it possible in football for the sinner not to do his job? Certainly. Is it possible in a political circumstance like Ford was in where it fails? And maybe you think it failed. Maybe you think he succeeded. I'm not interested in that this morning. But is it possible for a leader to try to pull things together and hold it together and the sinner fails? Sure it does. Could it happen in your family? And the answer is absolutely. The sinner doesn't hold when the family comes apart. The sinner doesn't hold when the family comes apart. How does it come apart? Sometimes there are strained relationships with the mate. Where husbands and wives hardly talk to each other. Their relationship is strained. And when they do talk, it's not good, pleasant conversation. It's not good communication. It's a very strained relationship. Sometimes the strained relationship is between the parents and the children. Or maybe it's grown children and their parents now. They're aging parents they can't talk to, they can't discuss things with. There's a strained relationship. The family's coming apart. The sinner is failing and the sinner is not holding when family is in turmoil. Some families are in utter turmoil where they're dysfunctional homes. We're living in a time where there are many homes that are dysfunctional and they think that's normal because they know of many other dysfunctional homes. Normal and in harmony with the Word of God are two different matters. It may be normal in our society, but many homes are dysfunctional. Many of those homes end up in divorce. So the sinner is not holding when the family comes apart. The sinner is not holding when we lose our children to the world. And maybe that's because of the turmoil of the first point. How do we lose our children to the world? It may be because the sinner didn't hold, our children never did obey the gospel. We raised them, we took them to church most of the time, and they reached the point of the age of accountability and they never did obey the gospel, and now they're grown children, have children of their own, and they never did become Christian. We lost our children to the world. The sinner didn't hold if, we, if they do obey the gospel, but they remain weak or ultimately depart. Maybe they did obey the gospel. Maybe they still go to church some, but they're weak as water. You could measure their spirituality in a thimble. And maybe they quit altogether. We lost our children to the world. Or maybe, here's some of the reasons that that would happen. It may be because they were influenced by the friends of the world. So how, how did this happen? Why did the sinner not hold? Let's go to Proverbs 26, uh, verse of the 12th chapter. Proverbs 12, if you will. Quite often people are influenced by the friends of the world. We, we, we deceive ourselves if we think, you know what? I'm strong enough that I'll not be influenced by their ungodliness. I think my godliness will overpower and influence them, and seldom does that work. You say, how do you know? Statistically, I know that, number one. Number two, I want you to notice at verse 26, the righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why is that? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Quite often we lose our children to the world because of the influence of their friends. Sometimes it's because of the poor example of the parents. Like mother, like daughter, the proverb said, Ezekiel 16. In other words, children see what's going on in their parents and it was a very poor example of godliness, a very poor example of dedication, a very poor example of, of loving and serving the Lord faithfully and consequently they have turned out just like their parents trained them. We lose our children to the world. Sometimes it's the lax standards at home. There are not strict standards at home. And we lose our children to the world. The sinner doesn't hold when the family comes apart, when we lose our children to the world, and when children are greatly influenced by loose thinking. So why isn't the sinner holding sometimes? I'll tell you why it's not holding sometimes. We easily swallow what we hear in school. 
You see, children are impressionable. Every humanist, trace back to what the Humanist Manifesto said back years and years ago. And what the humanists have said back for many, many years, they understood that if we're going to connect with the next generation, we've got to start in the earliest of grades in preschool and start on with their humanist thinking. And I'd mention that only to say children are impressionable. And so they hear things in school that they easily swallow. They perhaps buy into concepts they see on social media. They're impressed with the philosophy of their professors at the university. And so we send them to public school. I'm not opposed to that. I did the same thing with my children. And they hear a bunch of garbage. And they're allowed on social media and they see all kinds of things on YouTube and everywhere else, Facebook, everywhere else. Then we send them off to the university and they're indoctrinated with the philosophy of the university and then we scratch our heads and wonder, what happened to my children? I don't recognize this child that's coming back from school. It is not the same one I sent away. Let's remember the, the warning of 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Next week we'll put it in context in our Bible class. Be not deceived, which means you could easily be deceived here. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupts good morals. You say, that's talking about friendship. No, it isn't. It's talking about false teachers. What about false teachers? That could be in the school. It could be at the university. It could be in the church. And it was in that case. Association with evil teachers or those that teach evil things contrary to the will of God could easily corrupt someone who would not otherwise be corrupted. The sinner is not holding. I want to suggest to you when churches become weaker and there's weak leadership. Sinner's not holding because what we're seeing is as a result of that, not only are families coming apart, but when the sinner doesn't hold, churches become weaker and we have weak leadership because the sinner isn't holding. I want to tell you, it's a very sad, sad, sad circumstance where in many churches, it's hard sometimes to find men who could serve as elders because they haven't done well with their families because the sinner didn't hold. The children have gone astray. Perhaps the marriage itself is in shambles. Maybe a person of wisdom but can't lead because the sinner didn't hold. The sinner didn't hold. Morals become confused when the sinner doesn't hold. You see, it's when the home where we learn those morals and when the home isn't what it should be. We'd be like those in the days of Isaiah who begin to call evil good and good evil and bitter sweet and sweet bitter. We begin to call things by different names. And things that ought to be condemned, we begin to embrace. Things we ought to embrace, we begin to condemn because morals are confused. And all across the land, among some of our own young people, morals are confused. And then the nation deteriorates. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, the proverb writer would say. So what happens when the sinner doesn't hold? When the sinner doesn't hold, the family comes apart, we lose our children. Our children are influenced by loose thinking. Churches become weaker. Morals are confused. And the nation deteriorates. You see, when the sinner doesn't hold, everything crumbles around us. And you look around and you see churches and you see the nation and you see schools and you see everything, families. It seems like everything around us is crumbling. It's because the sinner's not holding. The sinner's not holding. One more thing. Let's talk about how the sinner holds. You say, I want the sinner to hold with my family. How can I make sure the sinner holds when everything else begins to fall apart? Let's begin to list some things. <clears throat> the sinner holds when the family has a leader. The sinner holds when the family has a leader. You see, God appointed the husband and the father to lead. Husbands are the head of the wives, Ephesians 5, 25. God appointed the husband as the leader. God appointed the man, the father, as the leader. That means he bears responsibility. It's not so much power and authority in a boss. As a child may think, I can't wait till I get to be a daddy and I can be the boss of some children. But it's the idea now of a weighty responsibility he has. It means he guides and gives direction. 
It all rests upon his shoulder. It means as the leader, he bears the spiritual direction and the responsibility for the spiritual direction of the family. That is for the wife and for the children. He brings them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That rests on his shoulders. And say when things go south and the family's gone south spiritually, he can't look to the wife and say, you didn't do your job. The buck stops here with the husband. He has to say, you know what, I failed in my job because God placed that on my shoulders. And I want to suggest to you that in many homes, it's the wife that's wearing the pants. And in some cases, it's the children that are wearing the pants and pulling the strings and have the control, and they've got the reins, and they're yanking mom and dad in any direction they want to go because they're in control and threatening to rebel if I don't get my way. The sinner's not holding. You want the sinner to hold, the family needs a leader, number one. Number two, the sinner holds when children have guidance. The sinner holds when children have guidance. The parents are to teach the children. We've already quoted from Deuteronomy 6. Teach them diligently to your children, Moses would say. And Paul would say, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's go to uh, the book of Judges chapter 2. Godly parents do not want their children to grow up and they don't have a clue about God. They want the sinner to hold. Let's go to Judges chapter 2. Do you remember in the days of Joshua? And the men who outlived Joshua, things went well. So Joshua 2 verse 10 says, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them that did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. See, the first generation had seen and they knew and they heard. They failed to teach it to the next generation. Let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78 gives me an, a, a clue as to what happened in Judges. Judges didn't tell me what happened. It just says they didn't, they, the next generation grew up and they didn't know God. Why? Why didn't they not know God? Well, let's go to Psalm 78 because Psalm 78 says here's what they were supposed to do. Judges too said they didn't do it. So let's see what was it they were supposed to do. Psalm 78, this is a historical psalm. Let's begin at verse 3 which we have heard and have known, and our fathers have told us, we will not abide, we will not hide them from their children. Things which we learn from God, we will not hide from the children. Telling the, to the next generation to come the praises of the Lord. Now let's drop down to verse 6, or verse 5. For he established a testimony in Jacob, that's the law, and appointed a law in Israel. God gave his revelation, that's his point. What do you do with that revelation? which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. One generation teaches the next generation. Now verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. You want your grandchildren to know the revelation of God, you better be teaching your children the revelation of God. Because you can bet your bottom dollar that if you don't teach your children anything about the revelation of God, your children won't even know there is a God. Your grandchildren won't know that. They'll have no clue about God if you don't teach your children. But let's go to verse 7. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. You want to make sure your children know and don't forget you teach them diligently to your children. You'll make sure your grandchildren know you teach it diligently to your children and they'll take care of teaching your grandchildren. You won't have to worry about teaching them yourself. You see, when the sinner holds, they have a leader. Children have guidance and children have discipline as well. Behavior is to be corrected. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, proverb writer would say, but the rod will drive it far from him. You see, behavior that needs to be corrected will be corrected. When the sinner holds, is where children have discipline. They have boundaries. You can't leave a child to himself. A child left to himself, the prophet writer would say in 29 and 15, brings his mother to shame. It's a reflection on the sinner. The sinner failed. But I want to suggest to you the sinner holds when faith controls. Does faith control your family? Is the sinner holding within your family? 
We walk by faith, Paul would say, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and not by sight. In other words, we don't walk by our feelings and how we feel and what we think. We walk by faith. What does that mean? We walk by the direction of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. When we have faith like Abraham, a strong faith, the text says not be weak in faith. Abraham had a strong faith. That drives one to do what others would not do, and it did with Abraham. He left his country and went another place. No one else would do that, but Abraham did. Caused him to be willing to sacrifice his son. No one else would do that, but Abraham did. When you have a strong faith like Abraham and driven by faith and controlled by faith, that simply means all decisions and all directions are determined by faith. Do you make decisions based on what's convenient? Based on money? Or do you make your decisions based on faith? This is what faith says. That's the direction we're going to have to go. But let me suggest to you something else. The sinner holds, and here's how it holds, when there are examples that are clear and they are strong. Say, I want the sinner to hold. How can the sinner hold in my family? You make sure your children have an example that is clear and strong. Children usually follow the examples they see. We cited earlier the proverb, like mother, like daughter. Children often turn out to be just like we train them. Just like we train them. The righteous man's children are blessed after him because of his integrity. The proverb writer would say in Proverbs 20 and verse 7. Why is that? Because he is a man of integrity, his children become like him, and they learn from his example. I want to suggest to you that examples must not send mixed signals. We may send a signal over here with one example of going and serving the Lord, but on other occasions we see examples of not serving the Lord. What have your children seen? Have they seen times when the service of the Lord was secondary to other things that were important in your life? Don't be surprised if your children turn out to be just like you trained them. Don't be surprised at that. Have they heard you minimize the service of the Lord being less important than your job? Don't be impressed or unimpressed when your children come along and they have the same attitude that you just taught them. Children have to have clear and strong examples. And finally, how do I make the sinner whole is when love begins to reign and continues to reign through the family. How so? You see, love is what binds the family together. Husbands are to love their wives. Wives are to reverence their husband. Chapter 6 implies love, though love is not mentioned in chapter 6. Titus 2, older women are to teach the younger women to love their children. You see, it's love that binds the family together. Every member of the family should be assured that indeed they are loved. One writer said that others in the family will forgive many mistakes if they are assured of love. You're going to make mistakes as a husband and as a father, as a wife and a mother, and as a child. And the others within the family will forgive those mistakes if they are assured, if the other, others in the family are assuring them that indeed you are loved when love reigns. How is it that we make the sinner whole? You say, I want it to hold. How do you do that? Does your family have a leader? Are your children getting guidance? Do they have discipline? Is faith controlling? Do they have clear examples? Is love reigning in the family? You see, when the family is what it should be, the sinner will hold. When the sinner holds. Is the sinner holding? I want to tell you, in some families, it's not holding. I hope it's holding in your family. We see that family and home is the center. We see what it means for the center to hold, and when the center doesn't hold, the chaos that is created, and we've talked about how do you make the center hold. How can I do that? Is the center holding within your family? If you say, I'm, in the future, I want to make sure my family is holding, and I want the center to hold, you must first begin by your obedience to the Lord. Are you a Christian? If you say you're not, then first begin by obedience to the gospel of our Lord and Savior. Would you come this morning believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins? Would you acknowledge your faith and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?